And so, uh, welcome to the second part of uh, this, uh, uh, these two lectures and also discussion. And uh, also, thanks to Aliska and Vit and Hannah and all the other organizers of the Photograph Festival and Mariana for, for uh, bringing us here and uh, for making this event possible. And um, it, it's, it, there are a lot, a lot of connections with, uh, uh, with uh, TJ's lecture, which I think will come out quite strongly as we proceed. We have two mics, so. Um, so we're not going to talk uh, about migrants as such, but we're going to talk about the uh, migrating meaning of ecology and its uses in contemporary art. And um, so the title is Filling the Curve of the Earth and Art and Ecology in Post-Democratic Times. And the title actually, The Filling of the Curve of the Earth, is a, a line from a poem from 1938, a French artist and a poet who wrote uh, this poem about need to slow down at that point. And uh, in this poem, he's got several lines which are kind of significant. So we're uh, not going to, we put the, the French up so you can see the original, but uh, uh, what we have here is some excerpts of this longer poem, uh, which I'll read out. So, uh, by slowing down, you feel the pulse of things. You snore, you have all the time in the world, calmly, all of life. We have all the time, we savour, we no longer believe that we know. We have no more need to count, we feel the curve of the earth. We no longer betray the soil, no longer betray the minnow. We are sisters by water and leaf. So, this poem was, was written by a Belgian-French poet and artist, Henri Michaud, and so it was also written in a period in the, in the 1930s, which are uh, a ver a very symbolic also from today's perspective. So people have suggested quite a lot of parallels between what's happening now and what happened uh, in the 1930s. So, on the one hand, in terms of a crisis of democracy with uh, Stalinism and Nazism, and also in the sense of the failure of Western democracies to stand up against Franco in Spain, stand up for the Popular Front, and also, of course, 1938 is uh, the year of the Munich uh, Agreement and of appeasement and uh, 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 the, the, the failure to stand up for Czechoslovakia against uh, Nazism. Um, on the other hand, the 30s, as, along with this, this political aspect, is also uh, the beginnings of a lot of uh, uh, aspects of the modern world that we know from the post-Second World War period. A lot of the, uh, the, the uh, elements of the Anthropocene, the period of the Anthropocene, which is seen as starting after 1945 or after 1950, the beginnings of, of them, a lot of the origins can be seen uh, in the 1930s um, in terms of the move to an economy which is much more dependent on fossil fuels. So 1930s was an interesting reference point from that point of view. Okay, and the poem we came across uh, in, in this book, The Shock of the Anthropocene, which is uh, by these two French authors. And the book is quite interesting, not just because it's a, a new book that talks about Anthropocene, but actually it really shows the, the long history of the Anthropocene and the fact that we have been aware of it for uh, centuries. And there is a history of this understanding what uh, is the human impact on the planet. And uh, another aspect of the book, in the book mentioned, which we find significant, is this idea of the environmental humanities and the understanding that we have to bridge this divide between sciences and arts. Uh, and, and so, a question that we want to pose in, in our uh, lecture is, can human species feel the curve of the Earth? Can we still feel the curve of the Earth, Earth after all the technological changes and um, uh, the kind of changing outlook that we have. Is it still possible? Are we too advanced to feel the curve of the Earth? And uh, uh, another point of reference for us uh, here is uh, 
the Russian-Ukrainian writer Vladimir Vernadsky, uh, who is also seen as one of the anticipators of the Anthropocene uh, notion, Anthropocene idea. And uh, he was a, a scientist who, uh, until his death, work, you know, worked in the Soviet Union, was a pioneer of biogeochemistry, and somehow managed to steer a path through the Stalinist uh, purges. And uh, he's also very well known today for being one of the uh, key figures in the, uh, in the um, development of the, of the modern understanding of the biosphere. And, um, uh, in, you know, at, at the idea of the biosphere as an envelope of the Earth, a place where the only place where uh, uh, species and living things uh, can prosper, can and where life can exist. Um, uh, and uh, in his writings, he also very much makes the point that uh, although humans have become this teller telluric force, this Earth-changing force, they are still completely dependent on the biosphere, just as are other species. As you can see here, so in reality, as he says, in reality, no living organism exists in a free state on Earth. All of these organisms are inseparably and continuously connected with their material energetic environment. So this is the curve, this is the um, one of the envelopes that we are talking about, the envelope of the biosphere, uh, which is uh, where the life exists and where we can so it goes up down to the oceans, it's above the volcanic layer and it's underneath the, the uh, stratosphere and the atmosphere. This is where we uh, will live and uh, it's important to bear in mind because especially if you think about the, uh, what we're doing to the species that we share the planet with and uh, uh, in the midst of the sixth ex extinction that we are now in and this is the human cause extinction. And, um, so this is, this is something to think about, this, this curve, this envelope, the fact that we are all part of this one Earth, and uh, we want to uh, bring another of the terms in that uh, we want to discuss today, and that is the term of uh, post-democracy. You can call it post-politics, uh, post post you can give it any names, but what is the... Uh, or is the characteristic of post-democracy is that it does take various forms. And there are many signs of this post-democratic turn in our present days, and uh, most often it's described as democracy itself. So when we, uh, just this summer we heard that democracy has won in Turkey, um, then we can think of the American election just now. We can think about uh, perhaps the best sign of the post-democratic turn is when politicians are re-elected with 98% support, or when the referendum referendums are uh, won by 98% you know success. That's that's something to worry about. Which happened recently in Hungary. And also, you know, some politicians went a bit far and they gave it a name, like in Hungary a few years ago our dear leader, that he called it illiberal democracy, what we live in. But this is a really big mistake, and he, went, he never mentioned it again, because once you give it a name, you become aware that what we are, what we at, is not exactly democratic. Uh, and um, so, so the, the, this, quote, this quotation from Colin Crouch, the author of Post Democracy, also gives this idea uh, of what, uh, what post-democratic post society is. He says it's, it's one that continues to have and to use all the institutions of democracy, but they increasingly become a formal shell. And uh, I think we can recognize that in a lot of uh, aspects of the current uh, political uh, situation. So the best dem democratic uh, tactics is the one which is very embedded in the democratic functions of the society. We can think of Brexit as well. So <clears throat> here are some other descriptions which we think quite interesting. And this has actually come from a, an art historian. And the, so the primary means of gaining popular assent is without doubt the use of power persuasion, the media. You might think about Murdoch, Rupert Murdoch and the control of the media. Another one. So no one is more skillful than they are in exploiting modern organizational techniques which make it possible to control everybody expeditiously from a small and frail centre. Um, cyber wars, hacking, trolling, we can think of that. Also, 
people who previously had not been taken seriously by anyone suddenly gained positions in various official functions and public positions. People with integrity became speechless. I have to think about the uh, new British uh, uh, Foreign Office Minister uh, Boris Johnson in that regard. Okay, but this is a quote which actually comes from a Czech art historian who wrote in 1949 about the Stalinism and the Soviet Union taking control of the Czech art world. We think that this, this text has been reread in several historical moments, and this is another one where it kind of rings true again. Yeah, and and uh, 1949, we already mentioned 38, 1949 is also a year which has some strange parallels in terms, especially of, of, uh, of Eastern Europe. That was a moment when uh, the curtain was dropping on this brief moment of, of uh, liberal experimentation in politics and the arts. It was the beginning of Stalinism. Okay, but uh, it's not just a historical construction. and There are many people talking currently about post-democracy or crisis in democracy. And just this month, Noam Chomsky has been talking about what would be the outcome of the American elections with the you know, ecological crisis really being neglected in discussions and also uh, really pointing out to what we heard from TJ about the real issue when the climate refugees will, um, will have real needs uh, that will feel much stronger than we do now with the climate crisis. And he says that 300 million people in India are already lacking the water. So, he totally disagrees with talking about migrant crisis now. We also, Monbiot was talking about, uh, George Monbiot is a British environmental writer who was just talking about the crisis of democracy uh, a few, few, few days ago. And he, he said, whether representative or direct, democracy comes to be owned by the elites. And this uh, uh, drawing by Dan Payoshi illustrates this situation, which we're all familiar with quite well. Uh, Gorbachev was just mentioning the biggest problem of today's politics, it's nuclear disarmament and ecological crisis. So there is this real understanding that what we're dealing with is really, really necessary to address, but somehow the politics is failing to address it, or when it talks about ecology, it's using it for its own um, purposes. And actually we want to use two examples of how ecology is used in exhibitions to represent these other needs and purposes. And uh, our, our first example is the uh, pavilion, the National Pavilion of Azerbaijan at uh, uh, the Venice Biennial of 2015, which um, uh, one part of it was an exhibition called Vita Vitale, so they had uh, several representations, two main national pavilions. One was uh, Vita Vitale, which we will discuss, which aims to give a, a very cosmopolitan, modern and advanced picture of Azerbaijan. And the other was devoted to their own Azerbaijan, Azerbaijani artists from the 1950s, pointing to the fact that Azerbaijan has its own art, which is different to Soviet art and so on. So two representations. In two very, very large and prominent pavilions with lots of advertisements all around Venice. If anyone was there, they'll probably remember them. So if we look about uh, who organized the exhibition, we can see that it was created by the IDEA, International Dialogue for Environmental Action. Uh, it was specially commissioned by Haider Aliyev Foundation from Baku, Azerbaijan. And uh, there were also curators from Artwise Curatorial Collective. And then there was also a scientific curator or advisor. And the, uh, the forward to the exhibition, which was also uh, printed in the catalogue, uh, gives us an idea of some of the motivations and ideas uh, behind this project. So uh, these are the words of Leila Alieva, the uh, founder of IDEA and vice president of the Haid Aliyev Foundation. She said, sometimes when you look around the world, you may assume that this idea of one sustainable planet on which birds, bees, plants, trees, animals and humans live together in harmony is a hopeless dream that will never be achieved. But I don't believe that is. That is why we founded IDEA, International Dialogue for Environmental Action, three years ago in Azerbaijan. Okay, so someone had a dream and someone is doing something about it. 
And uh, this is from the catalogue, we also have a curatorial statement. Now the curatorial statement is really interesting text too, it's a short interesting text, we give you just an excerpt to this, where it says, Binana di Venezia was established in... It's quite a long sentence, you better take a breath, it's a long sentence. Yeah, okay, in 1895, as the first international art exhibition of the city of Venice, and the very same year, the physicist Svante Arrhenius presented a groundbreaking paper to Stockholm Sci Physical Society entitled On the Influence of Carbonic Acid in the Air Upon the Temperature of the Ground, linking concentration of carbon dioxide to global warming for the first time 120 years later in 2015. Again, we see Bainala di Vezia dovetail with environmental concerns as we mark, blah, 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 blah. And then it goes, and really it's, I don't know how many of you have come across this really, really important um, coincidence that Pioneer of Venice was founded that year, and then there was this really important paper, and if you go down, and then you come more important facts uh, about uh, what happened in 1895, such as, uh, um, Nobel Prize was founded and so on. It seems like the curators actually did a bit of the um, 1989 Wikipedia search. I don't know. <laughs> 85, 1895, and it just came to some really co really convincing scientific facts that really come together. So, and this is what was in the exhibition. This is how they. This is a press release. From really. the press release. So they, they ex uh, describe the works. Multimedia works and installation explore the consequence of plastic pollutants, consumerism, climate change, dwindling resources, deteriorating land and seascapes, rising sea levels and endangered species. Now, there is something missing there which we find quite significant and will come out later. So now we have some uh, views of the uh, exhibition. We're maybe not necessarily going to dwell too much on individual uh, works. Uh, this is a uh, work, A Great Miracle Needs to Happen there. This was also uh, an important part of the, of the project. They had a laboratory where, which they involved sciences. And again, this is a, this it was, it was obviously felt to be a good idea to include scientists in this art exhibition and experts, scientific experts, and they made a, a big fuss about the scientific experts who had advised them on this lab. Uh, this is the work uh, Water Bones, so it's a very nice uh, pavilion building. Uh, on the Grand Canal, huge palazzo uh, for the exhibition. And uh, this is a work by Mircea Canto. Rosetta. Rosetta. And again, we want to look a little bit more about who are the people behind the exhibition. And we already met who, uh, the, uh, the uh, creator of the idea. And uh, we found out that she's also the vice president of Haider Aliyev Foundation. Now, this is what they say about Haider Aliyev Foundation. Uh, Haider Aliyev Foundation is the largest non-governmental organization in Azerbaijan. It was established in 2004 and has since implemented large-scale programs and projects both in the country and abroad. The main goal of the foundation is safeguarding national and spiritual values, the widespread promotion of Azerbaijani culture, and, and so on. So she, she is, the, Leila is just vice president, and the reason for that is because her mom is the president. And the mom happens to be the wife of the president. So it's... It's a family business, this foundation. Um, and so is the country. And what is the country depending on, or what is the country thriving on, is uh, also set on the money of Azerbaijan, where we see... The new manet, money. So you can see this celebration of, if you like, of extractivism, of the oil industry, and you can see here uh, some quite technical maps of where the oil fields are, and this is also very important, the pipelines. And also we all know the pipelines are very important. And Ursula Beeman, who was already mentioned, also has an exhibition on in the Photograph Festival, has a, a very interesting work, the Black Sea Files, following the routes of these pipelines all the way to, uh, to Europe. Um, and you know, th thinking about uh, Azerbaijan, to remind you uh, where it is, just to give a little potted history of the recent history of Azerbaijan. So it became 
an independent country in 1991 after the fall of the, uh, well, the breakup of the Soviet Union. There was a declaration of independence. Uh, in 1993, the first democratically elected government was overthrown by uh, in a military coup, and the former leader of Soviet Azerbaijan, who was leader from the 70s and then also in the 80s, uh, a man called Haydar Aliyev, who we already met his foundation, took over again. He ruled until his death, and then at his death, uh, his son Ilham Aliyev, who we've also met, uh, assumed power as the chairman of the new Azerbaijani party. And then, uh, then in 2013, he was re-elected to uh, a third term uh, in the presidential elections, and there was also some crackdown on human rights and so on. Okay, so um, there was also some WikiLeaks information. We don't need to read it too much into it. He was person of the year, but what is interesting that his teenage their teenage son has the property in uh, in Dubai, which is uh, which is the equal of ten thousand years of average uh, uh, income of Azerbaijan. And I think it's really, really interesting that we're talking in geological terms of the property they possess. So when you think of the Anthropocene as a new geological age, there you have them talking in ten thousands and tens of thousands of years. It's already a geological time scale. Um, so because this was a very ecological exhibition, they also wanted to, to show that, to demonstrate that through the way the exhibition was done. And just to pick up on one little aspect, which was first a little bit confusing to us, is they had the idea for the catalogue to reuse uh, off pages that were just printed to check the colours as dividers between the sections uh, of the catalogue. So in the catalogue, you th first when you pick it up, you think you've got one which is a misprint, but actually they, they're somehow reusing these pages as, as uh, divisions in the book, although one wonders whether they had so many accidental uh, uh, overprints that they had for all the catalogues they had enough to put in. So in a way what I'm implying is it was, a, uh, was, was a, to, to give the impression of being uh, very uh, environmental and sustainable uh, in this way. Uh, but the tricks like this also come from the, the very good curatorial advice they had, the very professional international curators that they worked with, uh, which is the uh, Artwise Collective. As you can see, it's a London-based curatorial collective and ideas studio who specialise in unique exhibitions, commissions, consultancy, and bespoke creative projects. And um, That's a really interesting definition for curatorial studies to think about. What is the professional curator and the role of professional curators? That, maybe we have some curatorial students here, is your aim to create bespoke projects for different organisations? And here are some of those. As we can see, British Airways, World Cargo, um, National Trust. Um, There's some quite respectable ones. Whitehall, uh, Whitechapel Gallery, uh, RCA. And I can see Haydar Aliyev yeah, Foundation under H. Okay, and then what is really interesting that you find out only at the back of the catalogue in the acknowledgements is how really they got the works together to the show, which was a show about ecology in huge palazzo in, during the Venice Biennial throughout. And uh, this is really through acknowledgements to private foundations and collections that uh, reveals how the works got into the exhibition. And this is obviously a very nice way of avoiding directly talking to artists and getting permissions. So, because it might be that certain artists who are included might not really want to be in that exhibition, but if the, if the work is already belongs in a collection, then the curators only have to deal with the collection and maybe pay money to borrow the work <laughs> rather than dealing with the artists themselves who maybe might have some ethical reasons potentially not to be involved in a show like that. Well, we only speculate. We are speculate, pure speculation. But, um, uh, what we want to, what this exhibition really showed, how ecology can be used to represent a nation as a very modern, very advanced, really caring about environment and the happiness of the bees on the planet, and really going into serious discussions as if it's the scientifically grounded exhibition, and so on and so on and so on. Um, but now we want to use another example. Which is a little bit closer to home, because we, we live in uh, uh, Budapest, and uh, this exhibition just closed yesterday, so you just missed your chance. 
uh, to see it. Um, this is an exhibition in uh, one of the biggest, largest art spaces in Budapest, the Muchanok or Kunsthalle in, uh, in, in Budapest. It's a very big space and uh, for this exhibition they kind of combined three different parts, three different exhibitions in one. The overall show was called Nature Art Variations and then there were three parts. Small Gestures, which was maybe the biggest part of the show, uh, which was co-curated by a Hungarian curator and a well-known international, cu well, and an international curator. The second one, Nature and Art in Hungary, 1960 to 2000. Uh, and then they had an, ex an exhibition, Eco Avantgarde, which uh, was the smallest exhibition, but um, which dealt with uh, uh, environmental art projects uh, coming from Iran. So it was, uh, the, all these things were brought together in this in this show. Okay, so this is the different uses of nature and ecology uh, for different kind of presentation and representation they want to convey. And uh, these are some images to get a feel of what the works look like, and what the exhibition looked like. So this is a, uh, don't everyone say anything about them. Um, so this one there was uh, drops, and again it's like this thing of a drop, maybe a, a raindrop getting physical form as an object. And here this, this, this installation according to the description is also is about communication with, with plants and it's an audio installation so you can hear some sounds coming from organic matter in the space. And there was also a, a little bit more what looked like a little bit of a participatory uh, uh, artwork, which, which people were invited, which on the main page of the website, to come in and paint stones, which were then put on the steps of the Kunsthalle. These people don't look very enthusiastic, but they're doing it. I wonder if they've been paid to sit there. Uh. So here is uh, also from the catalogue who was. Uh, uh, or who was who were the organizers? And we can see that the uh, Hungarian president, uh, Adlai Janos, was the patron of the exhibition, which is quite significant uh, in reading the exhibition. And uh, so this, there are these three exhibitions. We want to we looked uh, at the first one, which is the small gestures, the images that we saw there. And the small gestures was co-curated with Sen, as we said. And one of the curator again, they went for the international. Figure. Um, John K. Grundy is a Canadian author. He wrote several books about art and nature, and uh, he is based uh, in Transylvania, part of Romania, with uh, a large number, which is very multi multicultural, multinational place, but uh, with a lot of Hungarians living there. And uh, he really gave this um, um, Transylvanian side to the Hungarian uh, likings. So in this uh, kind of environmental exhibition, in the first page of his catalogue text, he says, Transylvania becomes a place of projection for the Magyar people with a resonance still poignant and powerful. Okay, but what is uh, interesting is that uh, he's, he's reading on Transylvania, the Transylvanian art is very much part of this Hungarian nostalgia and idealism and national uh, feelings, but at the same time, he also acted as a, as an international curator who invited artists such as Anthony Gormley, uh, Olaf Eliasson, and Gustav Metzger, who were also in that show. And uh, their works were uh, somehow in the back of the exhibition, just a documentation, very very small, and, and they, as if they did not want to draw too much attention on this international participants of the show and. Uh, it stays hidden the fact that they were exhibited in, in this context. <coughs> now, the next exhibition is really, really interesting, uh, and it was curated by the other co curator of the show. So, this was her solo uh, uh, part of the um, exhibition, and she did this really serious sounding uh, exhibition called Art and Nature in Hungary. Uh, 1960 to 2000. Now, um, there was no curatorial statement in this exhibition. We don't know why they started in 1960 and uh, why did they exclude the 50s. And we but don't know why they ended in 2000. But we can guess. Okay. And here are some guesses. So, <laughs> the next image is Imre Bukta. 
Imre Bukta is a, an interesting uh, neon god artist, still working in the countryside and uh, has the many interesting works. He was one of the very first artists who agreed to be in this newly founded Hungarian Academy of Arts called MM MMR. I think we have to say a few words about that to, to explain it. I mean, just to show you, so th this is uh, just, um, this, this, so the, the MMR is a new academy uh, of arts that has been founded in, in Hungary uh, recently since, two, since 2010. And uh, it's, it's quite a special organization because it, was, it went from being just a small private organization of quite insignificant artistic figures who weren't part of the mainstream to being uh, the best funded organization in the whole of Hungary with a budget which is kind of equivalent to the whole uh, Ministry of Culture and uh, with, with kind of uh, control over all kinds of aspects of art, a say in all kinds of things. And they have different sections, and uh, this is the, uh, from the website, uh, the fine arts section. I don't know if anyone could know, I mean, um, Imre Bukti is there. If you haven't heard anything else quite strange about this academy, which is representing and Hungarian art. And it's not about art. the age. So the age, Because maybe. we're not ages. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well done. So it's, it, it has a, some questions around, uh, uh, I think, uh, around, around gender. And just, just briefly, just to say that uh, it was also when it was founded, it was a huge scandal. It's still a huge scandal around this uh, MMA for the, for the, uh, for the art world. And uh, Imre Bukta was like someone who was first invited, accepted that he would be part of it, and then when all the protests came, he withdrew and left it, and then he went back in again. So anyway, so that's, he's in the exhibition. And uh, <coughs> so this is a little bit of the protest, to so give you a feel of the protests. So Are what did the art world do when, yeah. when this happened to the Kunsthalle? Because they took over, the MMR took over the Kunsthalle. So it used what to be, used to be a normal contemporary art institution, with normal programs, uh, became an MMR institution, and the normal art world, or however you want to call it, the democratic, if you like, um, uh, just protested. They wrote ob obituary to, uh, to the Kunsthalle, as, as we can see, it died in 2013, and they protested symbolically. And uh, this is all that happened. Yes. And since then, they staged many exhibitions, and this is the latest one we're talking about, where they talk about nature as something very neutral, something that is obviously a question of national and uh, nationality, and uh, without any sense of political urgency. And when they do talk about posthumanism or ecology, um, it's very apolitical, just very similar to what we saw before. Now we can look at some of the uh, works they had in that show. And also how they got it. Apart from the artists who wanted to take part, and this is one of them, we assume, Laszlo Mehesh from 1970, nice work. There are some it. nice work, you have to admit, there are some nice new avant-garde works mixed into this show. Turf Green Oasis, you see the artist standing in the street on a little patch of green. When I saw it, I also thought, in a way, it's how we feel in, with post-democracy, as little, little islands of, uh, uh, of, of somehow of, of where you can survive with the, what's going on around us, but it's also ecological. Now, this is a, like really was a very famous neon god artist in Hungary, Miklos Erde, and it's interesting they got work from a foundation um, which is also supported by the government, so they just borrowed the work in that way. Or, uh, they chose artists which are not longer with us, so they've had not much say. And um, another way, it's interesting, the title was In Hungary, uh, uh, the exhibition. So nature and art in Hungary, not Hungarian. But a lot of the works in the exhibition were from Transylvania, which from 60 to 2000 was no way in Hungary. Nevertheless, they did, you know, they have this side. And they also have artists, or talk about artists, which are from Vojvodina. And we know there is a large, large Hungarian majority, or minority. minority in Vojvodina. Now, there are no artists from Slovakia, and we're really surprised. Still, we realize that the reason they did not include Slovak artists... Hungarian Slovak. Yeah, obviously, Hungarians, because of Ilona Nemet. 
You have the view that the art is extremely critical and political and take ecology extremely seriously. And no way they will take part in this show. And this is the other side of the exhibition. There are so many artists who did not take part. And the most interesting aspect of the ending in 2000 is to is a very easy way to exclude all the contemporary artists dealing with these issues, including Tomasz Kasos, who is part of the festival and who is one of the leading artists um, at the moment, we believe, who works on these issues very convincingly. So in a way, what's happening is that there's the, there, there's a rewriting also of, of the of the narrative of the story of. Uh, uh, of, of, of Hungarian art, of Hungarian neo avant-garde, and also of art and ecology. And what's also interesting is the curator, uh, Katalin Kesheru, was also the curator of this exhibition from 1994 at the Ernst Museum called Naturally Nature and Art in <coughs> Central Europe. And you can see there's some kind of echoes of the aesthetics of the earlier show and some of the other works that we show today in terms of these big installations using natural. Uh, materials, but also what was interesting is that this was like the period after 1989 and they wanted to do an exhibition about Central Europe and so they chose nature, the relation to nature, as something that was universal in those, in, in the, uh, the idea that it was something universal that people could, that connected Central Europe. And obviously what they didn't talk about is the real environmental politics of Hungary now and just outside the Munchen of the Kunsthalle there is an environmental protest going on because the park is going to be uh, uh, destroy large bits of the trees, lots of trees will be cut and destroyed and there is a living um, protest going on with, ca with, the, with people in the tents protesting and occupying for, the, for this uh, because the whole new uh, museum court uh, will be built in the old uh, central city park. And they're also not mentioning the fact that uh, the laws of the national parks have been changed since this new government. They're not talking about the fact that there is a tax on renewable energy in Hungary. They're not talking about the nuclear power station which is built and the, secret, uh, the secrecy of the agreement is kept for 40 years and so on and so on. So this is exhibition which uses nature for other purposes without talking about what is really happening to the environment. So after all this, how do we feel the curve of the earth? And there are some other curves we need to think about when we think of the, uh, of, of the curve of the earth. earth. These are all curves showing some uh, uh, quite, quite important graphs as, of, uh, of uh, different factors, population, GDP. On your left you have uh, the socio-economic trends, and if you look at the dates at the bottom, uh, you, can, you can see uh, this line around 1950 where a lot of the uh, graphs suddenly go hugely up, like dams, water use, paper, and so on. And on the other side you have earth system trends, and uh, wh where you can also see how these changes in what humans have been doing have also had a really radical and immediate dramatic effect on uh, the systems of the earth, the natural systems of the earth. And th this is what we're talking about, the Anthropocene. This is this idea when, you know, when they recently, it became official, the Anth Anthropocene, according to the geologists, the strate stratigraphers decided it, it, it was a real new geological age. They, they chose 1950 as, a, as the best starting point because it's the beginning of this great acceleration. Okay, and uh, so this is the curves uh, that, that, we, that are really important. And so what can we do in the situation of post-democracy is the question, and uh, there are people who live in these conditions. And uh, if we look at the Halpetsky, he suggested you can emigrate, and so in that was for, in '49. But 70 years later, where do we emigrate? You know, the, the the other planets have not been discovered or are not available yet. And the other thing is you can go into um, uh, uh, what did he call it? Kind of in, in, in a, in a, into yourself or inner migration, you can try and stand on a little circle, a little kind of in isolation. And there are artists who are really trying to get to these points where they find their own isolated moments where, or uh, conditions, uh, uh, territories where they can work and create these conditions where they work uh, with their aesthetics and ethics meet and so on. And one of these artists that we want to just point out to say that there are artists, and this is one of them, we already mentioned Tamás Kasas, who, who are working towards the combination of ecology and the response to the current moment. And somehow combining this, these two approaches, one of withdrawal and then also of 
of participating or engaging and combating the situation more actively. Okay, this is where, where he's doing so individual Michael. chairs uh, because he's uh, calling for something that we heard in 1938, the need to slow down. Then he's also uh, talking about, in the next image, <laughs> about Pangea, we all belong to the same earth. And he's very much using the socialist imagery uh, to do so. And he's also referring to um, anthropology. But this this is, is a very different kind of agriculture and, and rural history to the, to the one that the kind of national oriented art historians look for. Because this is a, a history of uh, rural uprising, peasant revolts, uh, it's kind of chao chaotic, anarchic history which has been erased from uh, a lot of our official uh, histories. And again, we've got a, this is a nice work which also refers, uh, in a way, to the situation of climate refugees. What he's done here is he's taken uh, a, a piece of, of, um, uh, uh, of kind of ur urban, um, it's not a, a, a drinking fountain from the socialist city of Dunaivaros and remade it in this gallery situation and, and with a new function. It was no longer working. He gave it a new function. He imagined it could have a function as giving water to people in a UN refugee camp. So it's again this sort of DIY aesthetic. And also, uh, this is also quite important in his uh, work, this idea of self-anthropology. So it's also about your life, how you live, about lifestyles, about studying the way that you live. Uh, as well. Okay, and then one more artist we want to mention briefly is Otto Hudec, a Slovak artist who also does a lot of um, environmentally uh, critical works and points to the issues such as uh, in this work of Price of Water where he's uh, uh, working in the uh, um, where is it? Well, with, with the, the, the water crisis in sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, this is actually just a, a, a screen still from an animated film, and the animation is based of, is made out of him uh, repainting a canvas and then taking still shots of that, uh, uh, of that action, showing a, a, a water dealer, like dealing water. And you think about how people are so short of water that they would have to buy they have to buy like a litre of water, two litres of water from a, a water dealer. So it's really highlighting the problem of uh, water shortages. And you know, this, which is a, in a way the cause we've already heard about uh, of, of what happens after that is that people are forced to depart. And uh, in this uh, uh, project Long Long Road, which is a video and also a, a kind of installation, uh, he deals with the situation of climate refugees making these very fragile figures out of cotton wool, cotton wool and uh, wooden uh, twigs and then filming them on their journey from the south to, uh, uh, to the north. And it's a kind of generalized story. So it's not just one place, it's also some scenes from North, Africa, North America and also of, of Europe. So it's this journey of uh, uh, climate refugees. And here, this is in the installation, just a shot from the installation, you can see this situation of the wall, of, like, of people putting up walls, countries putting up walls against climate refugees. Obviously, what's going on, and hopefully we'll not be having too much more on the Mexican-US uh, uh, border, but also much closer to home here uh, in, in Europe, in Hungary, where there's now a third layer of this uh, barrier being uh, planned. And uh, it's interesting, it was in 2012 that he did this, before these walls really got uh, started. So. Uh, uh, that's kind of talking about the, the, the situation uh, faced by uh, climate refugees. And <clears throat> so what, what is, uh, how do we feel this curve of the earth and uh, in this situation that we live in? And just one thought about this, this idea of the stress. We always keep constantly kept with the news. On the, you know, just think about all these stressful situations that we currently undergo. And just recently, this, uh, this uh, Peter Slodrick description of this, the reason we have to be uh, under stress in this post democracy, so these so called democracies use it so well, they're so well organized about that. So he, he says, a nation is a collective that succeeds in jointly keeping uncalm. Within it, a constant, varyingly intensive flow of stress topics must ensure the synchronization of consciousness in order to integrate the respective population into a community of concern and excitation. <coughs> um, and yeah. 
So this is the situation of stress, and he also talks about... You know, so the artists find, artists, so many of us find a, a way to deal with the stress by finding our own individual refuge, where we free ourselves from stress, be it a walk, be it whatever you like to do, so that way you can live without stress. But sometimes it on gets... On the level of society, it can get, the stress gets so much that something snaps, and he also talks about that situation, said revolutions break out when collectives intuitively recalculate their stress balance at critical mo moments and reach the conclusion that existence in the attitude of submissive stress avoidance is ultimately more costly than the stress of rebellion. Now, this is this other moment where the stress gets too much and we don't know where we are. In some places in the planet it's been over, in some, some places it's building up. And we don't want to speculate, you know, what, it's really car, where, where we are. But uh, it's not that, uh, that we are, this, this uh, stress levels are increasing on the populations. And there is something to be done about that. And we want to end with Vernadsky again, because in his uh, this 40s text, he talked about the um, human bodies. And he said, if we put the whole population of the planet Earth in one space, we would feel, not feel the Switzerland. So really it's not about the body, it's not humans are not so much about the body, but actually about the mind. And he developed this other concept, uh, the concept of new sphere, the envelope of the Earth, which is the, um, the sphere of thought. And he thinks about it as the place that where we feel the human action. And there is this uh, arrow of um, uh, development of human thought from... Uh, it's kind of process of cephalization, kind of development of the mind, of the brain. And he tra he, he's a biologist, uh, and he, he traces it from, uh, you know, uh, um, like um, simple... Uh, creatures like mollusks and crustaceans from fossils all the way up to the human mind and he, he sees this this kind of progress in a way towards uh, the mind leading up to this new sphere as being a new stage in the uh, development of the biosphere so he sees it as a uh, as a new geological era in a way uh, yeah she describes it as uh, uh, a stage to which biosphere is now passing geologically and really is to think about these effects that we have on the planet and uh, what we're doing to it. And he, he had this conclusion, or one of the things he said in his text is that if man does not use his brain and his work for self-destruction, an immense future is open for, before him in the geological history of the biosphere. Now this is very optimistic. Uh, message which we, which, with which we want to end, but we have to know that he was a Stalin scientist, a Stalin Prize, and he was writing during the obli obligatory optimism of social theorism. Thank you.